feedback. Um, I'm kind of just trying to get a guess of how many people it looks like. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. About twenty. We have about twenty, maybe up to twenty-five people here. I don't know how many of you were at the Journeys luncheon. I told my story there. I will just give a brief synopsis of who I am. My name is Michelle Liu, and this is my third conference. My first one was in 2014. Are you okay if I take off my mask? Please. Okay, because there are lights on me, and I feel like I'm going to start sweating. Um, and I like to smile. So um, I'm a physician, I'm an otolaryngologist, which is an ear, nose, and throat doctor, but I'm also the parent of Esther Liu, who is not here at this moment, but she's at the conference. She's 12 currently, but she was diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension when she was two and a half. And um, brief of the story is that she, she was pretty well. We had to get screened for us to live overseas. We moved overseas in the summer of 2012, and it was a very hot summer. So the only thing that we really noticed was odd was she was very sweaty. She was a sweaty kid and fussy. And, but, you know, she's a toddler. Um, and that day when she collapsed in front of me, um, she was just having, I thought she was throwing a tantrum but she actually was not breathing and her heart had stopped. And so she had idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. Um, she had wonderful care in Holland and we moved back to the States to the Mid-Atlantic region where she also got excellent care and um, eventually had a lung transplant in 2014, shortly after our first conference. So it's very meaningful for me to be here as a caregiver because I, as a physician, have been on both sides of the bed, so to speak. And um, in my journey with Esther, what I didn't mention this earlier, was that um, translating a lot of medical things, whether it's to your spouse, but certainly to your child, can be a challenge, you know, or receiving a lot of information and receiving a lot of the burden of care as a caregiver is stressful. And I know having been in and out of the hospital with my daughter, I have to find some way to make it fun. Um, you know, one of my favorite movies is Life is Beautiful. It's, it's about a father who got his son through the Holocaust. Sounds um, like an oxymoron, but I remember that movie as I go through this experience with her because there's some very morbid things or hard things that we talk about. And, you know, I've dressed up the IV pole to make it a character. I've, you know, said, okay, we're bronchoscopy buddies. We're going to take a road trip to Philadelphia. I've done many things to make it a, a softer experience for her. Um, but at the same time, I have to remember the care for myself as a caregiver. And it might be taking a five-minute nap before doing this. I did that. She <laughs> tapped me on the shoulder. It's time to go, Mom. <laughs> but, you know, take those moments to care for yourself. And remember, it's very important for you to be around in order for, for you to take care of your special family member or friend. So uh, I wanted to kind of get to know who's in the room briefly. I'm really the warm-up to our professional self-care person. The other Michelle, we've had a great time getting to know each other because we're the Michelles. Um, but if we could go around the room and, and tell us your name, you don't have to say your last name if you don't want to, where you're from, and this is a special question. If you did not have pH in your life, what would you do? Like in a fantasy world, because our, our vision for PHA is a world without pH, right? So for me, I never thought I would want to live in Europe, but when this all started, we were living in Italy, and it was the most fantastic experience that I often dream about having again, but because my daughter needs care in Philadelphia, we're kind of tethered to the United States, but my dream is in a world without pH, I would be back in Italy um, enjoying living there. So who else, would, and I'm from Virginia currently. Would anyone else like to, and you don't have to if you don't want to introduce yourself, but go ahead. Tell me the things again. So your name, where you're from, and what you would do in a world without pH. I'm Deborah Bird. 
I'm Deborah Bird from Hartwell, Georgia, and in a world without pH, I wouldn't have to spend the time with my daughter that I do in the hospital. Thank you. Hi, my name is Pam. I'm from Richmond, Virginia. All right, <laughs> VA's in the house. <laughs> um, my mom has the pH, and she's 80. A world without pH, I guess, because uh, what I do is when I'm not, I live like five minutes from her, but I'm at her house like every day when I get off work. I get off like at 1.30 because I day starts at 5. So then I go to her house to either take her to rush her to a doctor's appointment because she makes all her appointments in the evening when I get off work. Mm. So I, I guess the day without pH, I wouldn't have to rush so much when I get off to, you know, to take her to so many doctor's appointments. So that's thank good. you. Uh -huh. Thank you. More leisure time than... Rushing over to her house. Hi, my name's Mona George. I live in Loveland, Ohio, but my daughter lives in Nashville, Tennessee, and she's the one that has pulmonary. Um, we would be on vacation. We haven't been on vacation. The two of us always take a trip together every year, and it's been almost four years since we've had. I mean, this is our, our biggest trip we've had mm -hmm. <laughs> from Nashville to here. Congrats. <laughs> but. Um, I'd be on vacation with her. I would live down here, but she won't let me. And she won't, <laughs> and she won't move home. But that's what I would do. We're going to be you. setting up her new house. She closed on a new house because she had to move from a house with stairs to a one level. Okay. So she was in the hospital for three weeks, and they put her on her pump. And she closed on her new house sitting in a hospital bed. Mm. We would not have done it that way. <laughs> right. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Marianne Biddle, and um, I live in Sicklerville, New Jersey, which I'm very familiar with the CHOP. It's right across the river. Mm -hmm. um, and in a world without pH, uh, my sister uh, has pH, and uh, we live together. And uh, we would travel to places with high mountains because there are places she just cannot visit because of the altitude. So I'll be going to Denver at the end of this month, but she won't be going with right. me. Right, you wish she could go with you to Denver. she can't. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. Anyone else from this side of the world? Hello. Oh, gosh, that's loud. <laughs> I woke everybody up from that five minute nap. Um, I'm Michael Lentz, I'm from Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida. And in a world without pH, um, I would be celebrating my 35th wedding anniversary in August. Mm. But in a world with pH, I've been able to meet some really incredible people here. And so, you know, as my wife always said, there's always some good with some bad. So the balance. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Ponte Vedra is beautiful. I used to live in Jacksonville before pH. Yeah. I'm Michelle. <clears throat> I'm Tony. I also am from God's Country, Virginia, um, Fairfax County. Um, That's where I'm my, from. <laughs> my wife is the patient, and I think we would certainly be doing more travel in a world without pH. Um, and I'd invite you and your family to dinner on the other side of the Ponte Vecchio. Thank you. We're um, east of Cleveland, and I'm a caregiver to my three-year-old daughter. Um, in a world without pH, we would travel overseas more, and I'd love for us to be scuba certified, but that's a dream that will we'll change a little bit, because that's not going to happen. You said scuba certified. Mm -hmm. I really yeah. wanted us all to be like a big snorkeling scuba family, and uh, my husband and I both love to do it, but our kids will find different activities to have to do. Yes, that's hard. I, yeah, I learned how to scuba in Okinawa, Japan. Lovely sport. Anyone else? Yeah, please. Hi, my name is Amy Clifton. I'm from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Go Tar Heels. <laughs> um, we would be more spontaneous. We have a six and a half year old son, so we are constantly trying to plan ahead and what we need. So we just get on the road and do something fun. Yes. Spontaneity kind of goes away when you have to, although I've been camping with medications and all that stuff, you got to get even more creative. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Mark. I'm here with my father, Romero. 
Uh, we're both from Chicago uh, with our, uh, well, my mother with PH. Uh, if PH weren't in our lives, uh, I'm sure my parents would be retired in the Philippines back home and I would have a, you know, a, a career job elsewhere, maybe in the East Coast, but uh, obviously we're here and uh, caring for our mother, so yes. that's our story. <laughs> Good thing you're here. Thank you. Did you have one? Or did we? You can pass it to each other. Hi, I'm Andrea, and I'm from Nova Scotia, Canada, uh, but I live in Charlottesville, Virginia, and before my son was diagnosed there, we lived overseas, actually, for six years in Europe, and so we've lived away from my family for 10 years, so if, in a world without PH, I would go back to Halifax, Nova Scotia, and live close to my family, but there isn't a specialist there. There's only actually two specialists in the whole country. So we're very grateful to be in Virginia, where we live very close to our specialists. Wonderful, wonderful. I know that's hard to be away from family. We need to meet, because I know another family in Charlottesville that you need to meet. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Melissa, and I'm from Minnesota. And my daughter has PH. And kind of similar to everybody else, I would be traveling more or visiting family more. Um, just the susceptibility to germs also kind of keeps us very close to home. Um, and also less time with insurance companies and pharmacies oh, yeah. and doctor's appointments and rescheduling and all that stuff. Fighting insurance companies keeps yes. me pretty busy. Yes, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Hello, um, I'm Hi, Tommy. Tommy. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Um, I'm originally from Warner Robins, um, but right now I live in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, my fiance Nicole Creech. Um, without a world pH, we're probably doing a lot more traveling, but since she does have pH, it's, it's limited. Um, she also suffers from sickle cell, so with those two combinations, it's really hard for, to really do anything. Um, she's limited, so it, it, you know, planning trips and stuff like that makes it real challenging and hard, you know, because day to day, it's just a day to day diagnosis, you know, how she feels one day to the next. It's really, it really determines what we, what our lifestyle is. So, you know, a typical day, maybe just staying in the house, you know, whether it's hot, cold, that affects the way she feels. Yeah. So, you know, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, I've been with her for four years. Um, and I wouldn't, I can't think of anything else but to be with her and support her and take this journey together. Thankfully that's recorded so she'll get to hear what you said. <laughs> oh, one more back there. My name's H.L. Robbins. I'm from Calcord, Oklahoma. That's a question I never thought about, really. Um, but I don't think my life would change a whole lot other than my wife being able to travel places that I've gone, like on mission trips to Israel uh, a while back. And, but other than that, I think life would stay pretty much the same. But on the positive side, I've learned a lot and met a lot of great people because of PH. So yes. that's why it's kind of a bittersweet question to, yes. to, to consider. That's right. Anyone else? Oh, more people. Go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Marta Torres. I am originally from Ecuador, but I live in New Jersey with my family. And in a world without PH, I would be spending a lot less time talking to the school system, um, fighting for my son's right, and uh, convincing them that a pulmonary hypertension is um, a debilitating disease um, that, you know, it's also an invisible disease. And I spent a lot of time doing that um, over 16 years. My son, it's already, uh, I mean, not 16 years, he's 16 years old, but all his school years are being on that fight. So that's my story. And we do have one from the live chat. Just gonna share. Oh, great. Um, there's no name, but it says guest. Um, we would travel more. My wife made the cruise with me to Antarctic Antarctica in December 2019 to January 2020. She did well, and there was ways to arrange for oxygen generators delivered to ship. 
Oh, from du well, his name's at the end. It's from Duane in Vicksburg, uh, Mississippi. Thank you, thank you from Mississippi. We appreciate your joining us. So thank you all. How much time did that take? I just want to make sure. I'm at 217. Okay, good, good, good. So I think it's important for us to know who's around. You know, we go to all these sessions and sometimes you never know, there's someone in your own city that you might want to meet. Um, and it's interesting to hear what we have in common. I heard a lot of travel and isn't that a big part of our quality of life? As not only as caregivers, but even for the patients, so uh, the ones we're caring for. So think about that, and also think about what you can do. It's interesting, someone said they'd never thought about this question. What can you do to make it a little bit, even just a little more of a reality? You could maybe get a little closer to your dream, even with pH. Um, sometimes it it does involve taking a little bit of risk or having a little bit of courage to step outside of your comfort zone. I'm not speaking as a medical professional, I'm just saying um, I've had to do that with my own daughter, you know, uh, making decisions about whether to send her to school, but really keeping her at the center of that um, because I know when she's happier, I'm happier. And that is part of your self care too, is maybe. Um, letting go a little bit because we tend to we tend to be very protective and sometimes that creates even more stress so making sure you're communicating about priorities and negotiating is part of taking care of you if that makes sense um, I asked my daughter if she were here what she would say is how she cares for herself and she mentioned exercise you know, and getting outdoors and playing with other kids. So if I kept her from doing that, that um, would take away a lot from her quality of life. I'm gonna transition a little bit as we discuss more how do we care for ourselves as caregivers, because um, it takes time, and a lot of what you mentioned was time-consuming phone calls and going to the hospital and missing out on life because you spend so much time taking care of your loved one who has pH. Um, so I want you to think about mindfulness as a, a method of self-care. Mindfulness being enjoying the present moment. It's Some people associate it with meditation, which can take time, a lot of time. There's formal but there's also informal ways where you could take a moment to care for yourself using various techniques, breathing uh, before you enter into a stressful encounter at the end of your day or at the beginning of your day. For me, sometimes between patients, I need to take a minute or two just to breathe and reflect, to let go of some of the anxieties and fears or things that are distracting me. Because we tend to multitask all the time, right? We're thinking about our loved one, we're at work, we're doing this and that. Have a whole list of things that we're doing during our busy day to learn how to train ourselves to stop. Sometimes just to listen. Sometimes it's just listening to my daughter. She's constantly complaining, I'm not listening. Taking the minute or two to listen is a way of relieving stress taking a minute or two before I get out of my car and enter the house to do some breathing and, and just be in the moment is a way to deal with stress. Um, so I'm gonna transition to the other Michelle as we talk more about self-care and she has a lot of other tricks in her bag. But thank you for participating in our introduction. Here, let me take this off. Hi, I'm the second Michelle. And I am a caregiver. My husband was diagnosed with pulmonary arterial hypertension in 2013. And I'm also the facilitator for the caregiver call that's once a month with, through Pulmonary Hypertension Association. And in my professional life, I'm a licensed counselor in Oregon. I'm, I live in Bend, Oregon. And I changed my focus in my business when my husband became sick 
because I suddenly realized that us as counselors, we're not ever trained. It is not part of social work. It's not part of a licensed counselors or anything. I want to deal with people that may never get well. See, everything is, uh, you're going to get better. There's going to be this, you're over it. And insurance companies want that. They want that six sessions, you're done, going, and here's a group that doesn't fall into it. And a lot of people don't like dealing with it because it reminds them of their own death. It reminds, it's uncomfortable. Even people trained in my field don't necessarily like working with this. So from that, I've had to learn things to help people feel better and be better quickly. When people like you come in, it isn't always, I'm gonna talk each week on my struggles. I want to get better now, I'm tired of it. I already know I feel bad. So the majority of them don't wanna be in talk therapy for years. So what I'm gonna tell you is simple things that I tell my clients when they come in that work that are easy to do, quick and simple, and because if I won't do it, you won't do it, and it's gotta be something that's workable. So one of the things we're gonna start with, and I'm glad Michelle Brent mentioned mindfulness, is I also agree that mindfulness is not necessarily, you're sitting there cross-legged trying to make your mind blank. And actually that's useless, because with an MRI it shows that if you're doing that, your frontal lobes are actually more active than you are normally. So it's really doing the exact opposite and it's not helping. So if people find it didn't work, that's because that's one version, I think for people who have a masochistic tendency. That's my own personal opinion. On the other hand, mindfulness really is focusing on something so you forget what you were just doing. See what I mean? It's, it just teaches you to shift the thought. That's really what it is that I can go, oh my God, I'm thinking about, um, uh, uh, you know, somebody somebody just died, You're like in our groups, I'm a sport group leader, I forgot to say that, in Oregon. And, you know, you get hit with it, well, it may not be the appropriate time to think about it, you're driving, mindfulness teaches you to go, I'm not thinking about that now, I'm thinking about this. And I'll start off with that to begin with. And what it really is, again, is focusing on anything as if you had to write about it or teach it. So one of the techniques I learned actually came from a workshop, it was before COVID, for nurses who were, emergency room nurses who were experiencing burnout. And what they were told to do was to, and you can do it now, breathe in and out, we don't care how you're breathing, but I want you to observe your breath as if you had to describe it to somebody else. That's not the usual thing you hear. You see the go, watch your breath, and you're going, yeah, I can feel my stomach going in and out of my chest. But if you breathe in like that, you're going, oh my God, I feel my nose, nostrils get bigger. I can feel the breath coming in. My chest is going up or out. What does it feel like sitting on the chair? You're really heightening everything physical in your body, breathing in and out. and. Um, and that's what they were recommended to do for three minutes a day. You can also do it with things you do. I discovered when I thought back on um, when I taught my oldest daughter to drive. I've been driving for 25 years and then I had to go, well, what do I do when I get in the car? I'm so used to jumping in, you know, putting the key in, going. I had to sit there and think as if I had to do a manual. What, where do I put my feet? What do I actually do? That is mindfulness. And so you could do it with all sorts of activities. And you can do it with your, if you're doing something at a time, what's really going on, becoming very aware of the moment is mindfulness. So remember that in the future, it'll help you. And it teaches again you, to change your thoughts so you can go from one thought to another till it's not appropriate to go back to the thought that you were thinking about. So the next thing I wanna go into is the breath. And you, I, many of you have done, have tried that. You probably have heard that. But I'm going to give you some variations that work. Because everything I tell people, it's based by science. There's studies showing it. And it has to work. So I've done a lot of research with it. So the first breath I'm going to talk about, I call vagal breathing. It's also called pursed lip breathing. And what it is, is you're breathing in through your nose for three, you're breathing out for six as if you're going through a straw or, or a feather. It's direct. It's not, a, it's not a lightweight breath, but it's in and out longer. 
And one of the things that they found that it did, is it, which is why I call it the vagal breath, is there's nerves between the gut and the brain, the vagus nerves, that when you go into fight or flight, and all of you are in fight or flight, and your, the patients, your, your loved ones are in fight or flight, because the, for them, their body's going, something is really wrong. And it's all the time because it doesn't go away. That's why with people with chronic illness maybe react more strongly to a stressful situation because they already are on alert because their brain is trying to keep them alive and safe. And you as caregivers, there's something called vicarious trauma. You're experiencing it also because you're connected with them. So that's why one of the reasons why you do need self-care is because you are being heightened the same way in fight or flight because you're aware of like some of you talking about if they're having a bad day, what's going on? Is this okay? Do we need to go to the ER? What's going on? So going back to the breath, breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth longer. That's the best way to remember it, in and out. The other reason why you want to do the nose, it's one of the parts of the body where natural nitric oxide is created opens your lungs up, opens the sacs up in the lungs, kind of like for any of your loved ones that are on Sidenafil. It's opening it up. And it actually will cause your oxygen levels to go up. My husband, luckily not very often, but we've had a case where he's not been near his meds, took too long to get home. By, by doing the pursed lip breathing, this vagal breathing, he was able to get his oxygen levels up a little bit and get home without passing out. So it's a really good thing to remember. Again, it's in shorter, out longer. To Are we going to practice? And, okay, well, let's yeah, do yeah, this. Let's practice. So breathe in through your nose. You can do it with your mask. And just breathe out through your mouth for three. Breathe in through your nose. Breathe out for six. I said it wrong the other time. In for three out for six. You should start noticing that there's a little bit of calmness coming in. Do people see a difference with it, even with the, such a short time? You know, with it, hands up, you know, yeah, yeah, doing it. You don't have to close your eyes, I just yeah, like to yeah, do it. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to build on this, add some things to it, that why they work. If you add belly breathing to it, so see, you didn't have to do it. This is the basic. You're anywhere, something's going wrong. It's a way you can calm yourself down very quickly. Because the other reason why you need to calm down is all of you know if you're in a bad mood, your loved one's going to get in something worse. You affect everything. And that also is stress on you because you really got to watch how you're feeling because you're affecting them. And uh, that's added stress for you. So if you add belly breathing to it, one of the things that it does is it in the gut is one of the areas, actually it's a, I think it's the most dominant area that creates uh, serotonin, other endorphins. And so you're going to actually be releasing natural endorphins that'll calm you down by doing that. It also helps regulate body temperature too. And, um, and if you add while you're breathing hands on hips, there's studies out of the Harvard that show that your cortisol levels go down. So it calms you down. And all these things, the more you do it, it's like it's practice. Uh, I tell people I live in ski country. If you take one skiing lesson, you can't expect to be on the ski team for the Olympics. You practice it, and then the brain starts getting a body memory, so it's more powerful the more you use it. So again, it's practice. So you may not have room to put your hands on your hips, but kind of breathe in and out. Oh, and putting your hands on your hips will actually cause you to belly breathe. And just do the same thing. Breathe in through your nose, out longer through your mouth. Breathe in through your nose. Breathe out longer through your mouth. Breathe in through your nose. And out more through your mouth longer. This is also a good thing to do before you meet doctors. It centers you. It makes you more powerful. It really does. There's a lot of body, there's a lot of studies on it of um, that one of them they did at Harvard that people, the students that did hands, you know, the dominant poses and others did passive poses and they were all filmed, 
they were asked by another group of researchers to say, who would you hire? And the people that had done a dominant pose were the ones they would. And I, like the researcher with this project, prefer the Superman or Wonder Woman you know, pose, that really there is something about it. And so it's really good. Uh, I also taught women, I did for three and a half years, women convicted of assault. And most of them were uh, the victims that were turned in um, uh, by the bullies to the police. And I t they had no self-esteem. And by having them stand, they've shown for five minutes a day and doing the breathing will actually increase your self-confidence. You're gonna start feeling better about yourself. So there's some benefits they've been able to prove with these studies, which are exciting. So the next thing I wanna go into is changing it just up a little bit, the breath. Again, simple. Uh, there's an, it didn't come from here, but these people have promoted a lot. HeartMath is an institute, I think in Colorado, that does a lot of research on stress. The breath that they recommend, and I'll turn sideways, is in through the nose again, and imagine it's going down and coming out your heart center. So you're just imagining changing the direction. You're breathing in. Again, you're not counting. They actually do four in and four out, but I don't care. Breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. And that also is another way to do it. Uh, again, I tell people do the other in shorter, out longer. The reason why I bring it up is there's um, institutions like the military. Uh, Navy SEALs are taught that what they're taught, and we're not gonna do this one because I'm gonna have you do another one next, is they're taught the total box thing. Four in, hold four, four out, hold four, four hold in, hold four. So see, they recognize that it's useful because these people, when they're in, of course, very extremely dangerous situations, this is what they do to focus for themselves. I don't generally, I'm just telling you about it to show how people have used this. Uh, it's too complicated for me. I'm sorry, I can't count that much. You know, I mean, that, that drives me nuts. And again, I don't teach things if I don't like it. But I wanted to show you that there are people that recognize that this does work. So this, we are gonna use it a little bit. We're gonna go back to the heart math thing, breathing in and imagining you're breathing out through your heart. So it's, you're not doing it, you know, I mean, you know that's impossible. But imagine you're directing it here. This is where it gets exciting. If you do things with intention, you can make it more powerful. And what I'm talking about is breathing in what you wanna breathe in, I'll give you an example in a minute, and breathing out what you don't want. I can breathe in resilience. I can breathe out guilt. See what I mean? I could breathe in peace. I could breathe out frustration. You can use that and it works. It's a way of relieving what you've got going on because you are going to be experiencing, as a caregiver, and you all know this, a wide range of emotions of how the hell this happened, this wasn't what I had in my life plan, to, you know, uh, I'm really worried, you know, what's going on? You know, we, we, we have every emotion you're gonna, you know you've experienced. And so think right now for a moment, let's practice that. What do you wanna breathe in right now? And what do you wanna get, get rid of? It's really a good technique and it works. Has everybody got something? Okay, so we're not gonna count breaths or anything. Just breathe in what you want. Breathe out what you don't want. Breathe in what you want. Breathe out what you don't want. Breathe in what you want. Breathe out what you don't want. It works really well. It actually is a form of self-hypnosis. Hypnosis is repetition. We do this all the time. Now you wanna direct it because it'll make you, again, more powerful. Again, you've gotta deal with the medical world. Sometimes that's like a brick wall. And then other times you've gotta deal with a loved one with a really bad day and losing it. You know, you've gotta be able to handle all those, all those different things. So recap of it, the purse lip bagel breathing is in for three through nose, out for six. Add belly breathing to it and hands on hips makes it more powerful. But again, you could be driving. You can't exactly take your hands off the wheel, but you can do that breathing while you're driving. 
and, uh, and then remember, I can breathe in something that I want, and I can breathe out what I don't want. I can breathe it in. Now, let me add one extra thing. Can in this I add something yeah. before yeah. you go on? So what I, what I appreciate about this is, although I, I have no idea what the response is out there, I see nods, and maybe there are people who are like, I can't do this. But one of these, if you look at the big picture, it's recognizing what you're feeling and responding somehow. So sometimes we're feeling angry or frustrated, sad, these emotions, whether it's with the person we actually really love, and we're not expressing it. So sometimes you might need to recognize first, why am I feeling so tense? It's because I'm afraid. And even just communicating that can be a way to, that's kind of like the breathing out, you know. I'm really frustrated that we can't travel. I know we can't, but this is a frustration to me and it's, it's a stress as well. Or even communicating to your doctor, I'm angry that we're not making any progress. Sometimes we keep those feelings in and it just piles onto all of the stress we're already experiencing. So some of the mindfulness is actually being able to take a moment to recognize what you're experiencing at that moment of stress. And then you have things you can do about it. So the next part is, is that on some, we do influence other people. You can also be breathing in maybe resilience and you can send it out to your loved one, love. See, it doesn't have to be negative. What's your intention? And that actually influences it. Uh, there, uh, there actually was a corporate program in the 90s that they taught that to executives to go, how do you influence people? And they were taught to shoot energy at each other, the thing to influence it. And you think about it, what do speakers do? I'm projecting myself out, actors, I'm projecting myself out. And so you can actually send something. And I love a good example came from a marriage and family therapist in New York. And what she said, her husband, she said, should have been a lawyer. He always had the, he always won their arguments. And he said, one time he said to her, now Laura, and he started going through his stuff and she remembered to do it and she sent love at him. And she was doing that. And he, she said it was the first time in 14 years he forgot what he was saying and he came down and sat next to him. So if your loved one's having a bad day, send something to them. Send love, send healing energy, prayer. We don't care what it is, it actually is a form of it. Send it, it influences people, it can affect things. And so we have a little bit of control. Mm -hmm. So that's what's so neat about doing it with intention. You can make yourself stronger, but you can also influence other people. Um, you know, because think about it. If you go in a room and someone is mad and, you know, what you're after a while, you're, you know, we, we pick the emotion so you can change things. So that's, I almost forgot about that. Thank you. I remembered it when you said that. So I'm going to uh, end with a couple more little things that you can do using your body to change things. Smiling. If you smile, and even if it's a fake smile, for two minutes, it starts dropping again, endorphins in the brain, dopamine this time is the major one. And it also causes a disconnect to what you're upset about. And, so, and also, I've had a client in my office in a full-fledged panic attack, and I told her to smile and made it do it. She's looking at me like, you're nuts. And in two minutes, it'll drop. It'll drop. And if people say, I smile, you don't smile for two minutes, it hurts. You know, and doing it does change things. So use humor. So you could be, oh my God, I can't handle this. Just hold it. Doesn't matter what you're thinking. That's what's so brilliant about it. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. The other thing is I actually wrote a few things down. Smiling lowers heart rate, reduces stress, increases productiv productiv productivity, uh, reduces pain. It's a great painkiller. Mm -hmm and boost the immune system. So there's a lot of benefits to smiling, but it's the two minutes seems to be the magic thing. And then also laughter and comedy. After something really difficult, having laughter makes it easier. It eases the, the anxiety of, or the pain that just happened. Um, that's why you hear of things like laughter yoga that was developed in India with this one doctor who was dealing with depressed uh, elderly women, I think they're in their 60s and 70s, 
and nothing was working and getting them to just laugh, deliberate laughing actually uh, does help. And the one thing that they'll do in there is they'll go, ha, 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 ho, 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 and they do it a lot. I found after a death in the family, you could be really upset just going, ha, 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 ho, 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 no enthusiasm, nothing. It starts making you feel better. There's something bizarre about that. So remember, comedy, you can always be listening to something, looking at something that's going to help you. And then the last thing is, when you're in a good mood, think of the things you can do when you do have that free moment. Because it's like going to the grocery store, you're going to forget. So have a list ahead of time, the things that make you feel good. Have a list of these things you will forget. To go, oh, I could do this, until it becomes a habit. The more you do it, it becomes a habit. And that's all I prepared for today, because I didn't know how much time we'd have. Any questions? We could do that Actually, now. before the questions, yeah. I want to add one more yeah. study um, about gratitude. Oh, yeah. So Duke University did a study uh, with providers, and you're all providers. You know, she's a social worker, I'm a doctor. You guys are your doctors in your home, right? Think of yourself that way, your, your nurses. Um, providers wrote a gratitude letter, and the effects of that expressing gratitude, I appreciate this about you, I appreciate that, either whether it's to a person or, actually the letter was to a person, the the reduction in depressive symptoms lasted for a week and a month after that one act of expressing gratitude. And there have also been studies um, of daily, you know, three things I'm thankful for at the end of the day. You will find that it's a great way to treat stress and a great way to reduce any of those really heavy feelings that you're having as a caregiver. So that's something to remember, gratitude as well. And when the person hears the gratitude, it even builds on the strength of your relationship, which helps you to endure uh, whatever you're going through for years and years to come. So yeah, that's it. Any questions for us? This may have been a surprise. Who knows how we take care of ourselves it is related to breathing. This isn't a question so much as a comment. Um, just talking about the breathing um, I recently read a book by James Nestor. Oh, that's breath. a really good book. I yes. Thought, I thought if anybody is kind of intrigued with what you're talking about, um, he does a really good job of um, talking about the, the science of what we've learned about breathing. And, and But he also kind of looks at it cross-culturally over time and how the philosophy of what breathing really is how that's changed, but um, he he creates some really interesting through lines of of the science and what we now know. Well, why we're monks performing the kind of breathing exercises that you're talking about um, millennia ago, and and yet um, we now know why that has a calming effect. Why it helps. Um, What's the name of the author? Like James. James Nestor. He's a, a journalist who for personal reasons, decided to really look into yeah. the lungs. And I, I just learned a lot about the lungs. I learned a lot about breathing, the physiology, and, and some of the things that you're talking about. Ms. That there's science behind it, and you're right. That's Absolutely. a really good book. I think it came out a couple years ago. And with that, thank you. So one of the things, is there another question? One of the things I was going to add in, in the beginning, and then I told uh, Michelle that I wasn't going to do it, is it was a study on happiness. And uh, it was really fascinating. One of the things that they didn't put in it was money because they wanted something that applied to everybody. What, what made you happy? And, uh, and it was really fascinating. Uh, the number five thing was helping others. You're already doing that, you know, helping other people. Uh, is really important. Number four was exercise, movement if you can, because you're not always going to be able to move, but if you can, we know it's actually the best antidepressant. It works better than anything, movement, and it doesn't mean it has to be you're running, you know, because I don't run anymore, things like that. Number three was spirituality. You need to figure out why this is happening. Have to some sort of, you know, 
something that you can feel comfortable as, as to why this is going on with life, uh, what's the meaning of it, uh, what is your spirituality, what is your religion, and become very comfortable with it. Number two was uh, uh, a community that you had to have a community and that's what you get here because people need that to live. That's our number two after uh, when you're born. Survival things need to be taken care of. And the next thing is who's your community, who's your connection. So when I have clients coming in and go, I'm codependent, I go, well, yeah, well, everybody is. You know, <laughs> we are. You know, it's, it's only if it becomes very toxic that it's not good. And, and there actually there was a study done. Uh, they went to different parts of the world to see how we live long. They had Seventh-day Adventists in California. They had people in Indonesia, China, different places around the world. And the key factor was they had somebody be on their back, you know, behind their back, somebody helping them. That that was so crucial, and many times it was relationships for years that were there that helped them. Now, interesting enough, this is what you need to ask for, which you don't think you're going to do. If some, there was a magic wand saying, I'm going to give you something you want, and this was exponentially higher than these four things, way up here. If you see that genie, ask for good sleep. Because if you've got good sleep, you can handle anything. And that was the number one thing they found with people who are happy. You need to get sleep. And that's going to be hard as a caregiver, because sometimes you don't get it. You know, but, the, but do you really work on that is going to help make you happy. And I thought that was fascinating. Any more questions? No, we didn't give you a lot of time. Yes. Yeah. Me and my son are going. Why don't you start over again? Because I don't think they would have heard you on the cam. Uh, okay. For people. My, I'm a caregiver for my wife for seven years now. And my brother is getting her 50th wedding anniversary on a cruise in July. My wife previously told me to go. So we book our cruise with my son way back in September. Is it, do I feel guilty leaving her behind? Or is it selfish for me to go? She is staying home with my other son to look after her while we were going on vacation. What does she say? Is she okay with it? She approved it to begin with in July last year. She said, you go ahead. So my question is, do I feel guilty and be selfish for me to go? Yeah, because actually you're giving her pleasure. She gave you approval. It's like when people give you a gift. She's getting something from it, knowing that that's going to help you. It's her way of saying thank you. So blow out the guilt. Go back to what we taught. You know, breathe in love. Breathe out the guilt. Keep doing that. Yeah. But on the other hand, if you don't think you would enjoy it without her, that's something you need to think about. Like, my husband doesn't like traveling without me. I am okay traveling without him. So, you know, if you don't feel like going on a cruise without her is going to be enjoyable, that may be a conversation you need to have. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And whatever, and whatever conflicted emotion you come up with, breathe it out. We have one back there and the one up here. Well, I just wanted to say that... Oh, she, you'll need the microphone. She wants to respond to his yeah. dilemma. This is like a support group. Yeah. I just wanted to say that you're actually giving your wife a gift by letting your other son take care of her while That's you're true. gone. That's actually a gift to her. For them to have that time together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very good point. She may not be able to express that she needs some time too. Mm -hmm. There you go. That's a great point. Well, it seems like we're all talking about the same subject in that regard because my wife, um, she depends heavily on me for her care. 
and uh, it's gotten so natural for me to care for her that she don't want anyone else. She don't want our son or our daughter. She don't even contact her sisters or either to uh, help her. Sometimes I feel like I need a break, mm -hmm. and I feel like if I was to even suggest that, she might feel offended that I don't want to be with her. I just need a break. Uh, that you may enlist the help of someone else saying, hey, I'd like to spend time with you, like, like the other people that would be willing to help. Because one of the things we do as people, we take the path of least resistance. We get used to things. And so she's gotten used to you and probably hasn't even considered anybody, you know, anyone else, because you do such a good job. And so you may want to enlist on someone else going, gosh, it would be so neat if I could spend some time with you, you know, and, and let you get away for a little bit. Here's an example. We were at a doctor's appointment, and uh, the doctor said, well, who's your caregiver? She said, I don't have one. He said, well, who's he? Oh, up what? Well, yeah, that's my husband. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she doesn't use that word. Does anyone else in the room have that experience or something similar that I see a head nod over here? Did you want to share anything or? around so but she depends on me like I mean for everything and she tells the neighbors the doctors people in church the Pam does everything for me I, I don't think she like they didn't want to do anything other than myself I said well I need a, I need some time too you know because I do have um, grandchildren that I try to go out of town to visit but I have to try to do it around you know um, doing something for her but she won't let anybody else do anything for her other than myself so. I will say that thank you for sharing that um, avoiding isolation is really important and we all know some type of isolation even just going through the pandemic everybody has experienced mm -hmm. some isolation um, to come out of that means really building that community the last thing that Michelle was mentioning um, coming to this conference even if you brought your loved one with you is a way to come out of isolation and the more you experience that, the more you will find others who can help you in this uplifting of your loved one yeah. um, or a sharing in the care. Like for me, I have three kids, I have a busy life. I actually brought two college students into my home who helped me with my kids. I mean, we literally do our little dates and leave our kids with those college students. So whatever it takes, sometimes you need to build trust within your community so that even your loved one feels comfortable with others yeah and the other thing you might even mention with your wife is is the example I, I'm sure you all heard about it if you're on an airplane and the oxygen thing comes down what do they say put on you first before you take someone else and I've actually seen even here at conference where if the caregiver doesn't get care sometimes they get sick and then the PH person is the one who has to take care of the caregiver and I've seen the roles reverse. So it's something you may want to look up some of the studies on that going, uh, you know, I need a little bit of a break and maybe start with little periods of time, kind of exposure therapy a little, little longer so you could be out a little bit more so she doesn't, you know, become panic and, and afraid. You have little things that you could be gone for a little bit. We have another comment back there. Took me a long time to get here, but I have noticed that I had to tell my family and dealing with pH and other responsibilities here just recently, I mean real recent, I'm overwhelmed. And by me saying that as a caregiver, it was a big stress reliever because having to deal with a rare condition mm -hmm doctor's appointments mm -hmm. and everything else, I had to be honest. And I noticed that the only way I could take care of me was to be honest and tell everybody, I need you all to kind of help yourselves. And I need this break. I love you and mm -hmm. I'm here, but I have to take care of me. And I had to say that, and like I said, it's real recent, but I can tell you all that it took such a load off of me and it brought a perspective to them that they didn't realize because they are dependent on me to do it 
but me being honest and them being transparent really was a big relief and you know they respected the fact of what my position is to them as a caregiver so I would encourage to be lovingly tactfully <laughs> honest but put your feelings out there too because if we are not taking care of ourselves we can't mm -hmm. take care of anybody else and being here is definitely one of those things it's hard for me to be here but we're glad you're here thank you <laughs> thank you for sharing that you know you. communication is a big takeaway from this mm -hmm. and sometimes you can't um, eat the elephant so to speak all at once but uh, you know if you recognize there's a lot you need to say even just small doses of what you need to say to be transparent to get the message across sometimes writing it is helpful I would avoid texting <laughs> texting your message but um, finding some way to express how you feel is one of the first steps and then even in terms of if you go back to the beginning we all talked about travel being a dream think about you know, it may not be that cruise. It might be a couple hours or a one-day trip, you know, to the next town or dinner in some place you've never been to before. You know, think about how you can make that dream a possibility in small doses, and then you may be able to grow a little bit in making that dream a reality because there's so many things you can do um, close to home, so to speak. But I think we're out of time. One more comment. I got a couple minutes, yeah. Can we get the mic up, please? Hopefully you got a lot out of this. No, you're fine. I have completely the opposite. I have a very independent 32-year-old daughter, went to school in Nashville, fell in love with it, never moved back mm -hmm. home. And she, I don't live near her, I'm five hours away. And she's got two brothers and my, and my husband. but. One of them's 10 hours away, and the rest of us are five hours away. She won't ask for help unless she really, really needs it. She's very newly diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel guilty because I can't help her because she won't let me be. Like, she asked me to come down with her. She had a doctor's appointment at the beginning of May, and she said, can you come back with me and ride down with me, which she's never asked for. And she said, I think they're going to put me in the hospital instead of just my doctor's appointment. And they did, because she passed out while she was at home that weekend. She came home for a wedding, and she was in the wedding. And she passed out the <coughs> night of the rehearsal. She told her doctor, doctor immediately put her in the hospital. And I stayed with her for two and a half weeks. And my husband came down like at the end of the second week. But I was there constantly. Yeah. And I guess I didn't realize I was getting as tired as I was and trying to, you know, the take care of yourself and stuff. The day we brought her home from the hospital, we drove separately. My husband brought her home. I wasn't there. She went home for an hour, and I threw something up the steps to get washed, turned around, missed a step, oh, no. cracked my head on the table, broke my elbow, and now I'm here with her, supposedly her caretaker, and it's like, I can't even open a bottle of pop with because I can't put the pressure on that. It hurts. But she won't let me help her. And like I said, I'd move here if she'd let me. She would. It, she's going to try she, to, they're going to try to keep their independence as long as possible because it's her way of dealing with it. Eventually she'll start asking for it, but I see them being very, very independent in the beginning because, you know, I'm not going to let this death, you know, basically death sentence, what I've been given, you know, overcome, overtake my life. So yeah. actually it's kind of good because she will come around. And I think we are probably out of well, time. Well, I pray to God that she doesn't really need me any more yeah. than she does now. Yeah. But because she, there'll I don't be a time when she will, happen. you know, because even if you stay good and, you know, for a while, we know it's, a, you know, it, it, it does decline. Well, another way to look at it, and now I'm speaking as a daughter, is she may feel or have a concept that she needs to take care of you or may feel like an additional burden, I hate to use that word, um, when you're there taking care of her because she's worried about you worrying about her. That makes sense. Well, normally there's not an issue with her having to take care of me. Yeah. This time, I mean, she came over from the hospital after almost three weeks. And an hour later, she calls the life squad to come and get me. Yeah. 
and because so, I passed out, and they they didn't even know I'd fallen because yeah. they were upstairs. So they see, came downstairs, a, and I'm laying there unconscious. And that's a perfect example of sometimes the caregiver becomes the patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the verses. Thank it's you so good. much yeah, thank for you being for here. here. This is great attendance. We appreciate all of you. And we'll sit here for a little bit if anyone wants to share yeah. anything personal.